my stash used to be a cute joke with my family, but now I don't feel like it's a funny joke anymore. They probably still do. <laughs> I, yeah, uh, it's a good thing I got scholarships to college because you have yarn. Kind of funny, I guess. Hi, I'm Michelle and this is my so-called handmade life. I have a blog by the same name and that is my name on Instagram. On Ravelry, I am Mamatronic. This is a knitting, crochet, making, whatever I feel like talking about kind of podcast where I ask you questions and you respond in the comments. Hopefully a lot of you have lately and that makes me really happy. And then I respond back in the next episode. So it's as much a back and forth conversation as I can do on the internet other than in forums and chat threads. So um, it only works if you talk back. And I have uh, several questions I'm going to be asking in this episode. So I'll have them. I always have my questions and then as many links as I can fit in the YouTube comments. Full links are always on my blog, which I also link in the YouTube comments. So there's lots of linkage always in these episodes and I'm going to have that for you as usual. So we've been talking the last month and on through to the end of February, we're doing a make along here called stash busting the new year. And I'm going to put the hashtag right here. Anything you make out of stash and it doesn't have to be just knit or just crochet. It can be macrame, bird's nests, whatever. Um, anything you make out of stash, use this hashtag to kind of encourage the rest of us who are trying to use what we have rather than buying more um, and letting like making supplies kind of take over our homes. I showed you, maybe it was in the last one, my horrible storage closet that's just packed with photos that need to be scanned, old writings and memory stuff, and then a ton of yarn that I mean, I am sweating right now. I had to get a cold drink because I was digging up this out of that closet to show something I'm going to make. I literally had to hold this to my head <laughs> before I turned the camera on because I worked up a sweat in the winter digging boxes and little this and that. And I did pull out some stuff that's not craft related. And I thought, you know what? I just need to let this be all the making supplies. And I'll put that other stuff somewhere else. Maybe it'll encourage me to scan the photos. So um, I want to be like Karen and I want a million hard drives with all my family photos on them. So we are trying to use what we've got. No shame to you if you don't have a ton of stash and no shame to you if you just want to keep buying more. None at all. It's all individual. But several of us have been discussing that we have a need to use what we have and focus on it. And I'm gonna talk a little deeper today about why and how maybe we've amassed some of this and how changing the way we store things away, squirrel stuff away, might change our lives in other unexpected ways. So that's what's been on my mind the last few weeks since we last talked. But I asked you guys, we've talked blankets, lots and lots about blankets. Let me show you my blanket progress. I am making a baby blanket for a friend and it's color work crochet, which I have never done. And I got to tell you, this is a handful. I'm probably doing this the hardest way, but I don't know how to use bobbins with this kind of yarn and it be any easier than what I've got. Basically what I do is I hold the blanket like this and this is the end where all the color work is happening. This is my working end. I just tuck the yarn inside and as I use it, actually I do it like this. And as I use it, as I use the skein, I plop it to the other side. And then the next one, same thing. And when all the skeins are on the other side and I'm using up this last little bitty bit, I pick it up and turn the whole thing around. And the reason I don't think a bobbin will work and this, the reason this is still like super 
tedious as this color theory yarn which is the best colors and the last baby blanket I made has been used really consistently and it still looks good I see it like when I volunteer to work with child care um, but it's super slippery and it just bloop, 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 falls out of this game so easy it's very hard to manage I'm going to ruin everything right now to show you guys my rainbow actually let me just turn it around oh my gosh it's gonna take me an hour to fix this here's what we've got so I did not do the right dimensions I got like I was watching a subtitle show while working on this and I'm not good with color work changes so you know you can see down here there's some messy messy changes right here but it gets neater up here I really think this looks good to me it looks great I don't think my dimensions are right I think I should have more white border here but whatever what I decided to do was I'm actually at the point where I should be able to stop. I probably have a tighter gauge because I'm like death gripping something new. And I'm just going to keep going until I run out of the green. That's the one I have. I had to chase a stray ball of yarn. That's the one I seem to have the least of. And when I run out of green, I will just finish up with some white until I run out of white. I'm going to leave just enough white to make a border all the way around because some of my edges look kind of, like, I don't think this blanket calls for a border, but my edges look kind of wonky. Um, let me show you. The reason I'm not giving you a great look is I just don't want to untangle yarn as my whole craft time tonight. Can you see this un, <laughs> like, I think I added some stitches here and then I subtracted them there it's super messy so I thought I would fix that up with some kind of cluster you know triple crochet cluster border or something it's it's a big project I mean it's this much yarn that fits in this basket that's one of those big projects that like we're filling a box in that messy closet but I asked you guys about some projects that would use a lot of yardage that aren't blankets because several of you are like yes I can make blankets but I'm tired of making blankets or I have plenty I don't enjoy making blankets and so you guys delivered with quite a few and I've added them all everything you've suggested whether it's big yardage product projects or not are in the bundle so when you recommend something unless I screw up I immediately add it to that bundle that's linked in the notes there's a lot of good stuff in there and Eunice had mentioned that she's looking to not buy more patterns so she's looking for things she has or free patterns so I'm also consciously trying to add free patterns to that bundle and there were already quite a few so when you go to the Ravelry bundle if you will do an advanced search and look for things tagged free I tagged anything that was free in that entire bundle under free so you should it should pull it all up I think you can also search by yardage if you want big yardage projects so and color work I, I have this these same tags you know that these things are tagged under so uh Severine <laughs> Severian let me know I've been saying her name wrong I've been saying it in my head wrong for like seven years eight years um and I even looked it up years ago and was told it was Severian. Um, actually, it was like some writer's name and they were pronouncing it. I was like, I guess that's how you say it, but it's Severine. Severine is a pretty name. Um, recommended all of those Stephen West blanket shawls, like schlanket shawls. Um, also Triangle Parade, which has been in my favorites, and, and the Botanic Shawl, which I didn't remember the Botanic Shawl seeing it, but she was saying it would be really good if you used for your contrast colors a magic cake and the magic cake is like our oh I haven't pulled this out this entire episode so I've got to make sure I show my progress on this blanket right but I pull this out all the time to show my magic cake 
and you can see it's all these leftovers connected with magic knots to make one giant beautiful magic cake uh, of yarn. And she was saying using that magic cake would be a really good way to use a contrast color and then use up more of like a fingering weight color that you have to um, make the botanic shawl, which I agree. And I'm going to flash all pictures of all of these here. So the triangle parade is one I liked and I remember I favored, faved it a long time ago. Um, you know, all of these Stephen West patterns, if they're a little too colorful for you or bold, I enjoy the color, but I also enjoy neutral takes on them. Um, just look through the finished um, like objects and you'll see if you have a ton of one color of yarn, you don't want to make a sweater, you might like making one of his textural um, patterns and just focus on the texture and not worry about a lot of color changes. So, um, Also, she said knitting a boxy. That is a big uh, like stash buster because boxy is that Hohi Locatelli like pattern. If you've been knitting for any amount of time, you've seen it. And the sleeve, the body comes out to here. Like you knit a very large rectangular type body and then your sleeve starts, I don't know, maybe just above the elbow. So this is a lot of fabric to really use up a lot of sock yarn or fingering weight yarn. But she also has a worsted weight boxy. There's a v-neck boxy. I think there's four different versions of the boxy. And so at least one is in the bundle, but um, very good idea. Sarah was saying um, the Stephen West bubble cardigan. Yes, that's another neat one, which you can make, I, I think you can make as colorful or as um, solid colored as you like. And that's a really great textured pattern and it's meant to have positive ease. So if you have like an absurd amount of yarn and you're like, well, this is, I hate to break this up for a sweater and then have this leftover. If you make a really large coat like cardigan, that's a great way to use excessive amounts of one, you know, weight of yarn. Claudia mentioned Tina Thorisdotter, uh, I think that's how you would say it, like Thor's daughter, Thorisdotter, um, does a lot of mosaic crochet patterns. And I had a few um, faved in my favorites, but I hadn't seen some of the ones that she was speaking of. She said a magic cake or those uh, Lion Brand mandala cakes like I showed you in my last episode that I was planning to use for a baby blanket and then just a gift blanket for someone with crochet. You know, they are, they make stripes and she was recommending one of Tina's um, patterns for that. Heather mentioned Albina's nostalgic sweater coat. I thought of that. When I had that prompt for you guys, what are some big yardage projects uh, that aren't blankets. Heather, I thought of the nostalgic sweater coat because it is this glorious long coat and it's very nostalgic looking for me. I mentioned a few episodes ago that a lot of Albina's patterns make me think of this um, aesthetic of some of the catalogs I would look through when I was young in the 90s. I had no money. I was a kid with, you know, very little. Um, the Tweeds catalog. I thought so many of the the clothing in there, it looked like it was high quality, like fabrics like wool and linen. And that look, that aesthetic is very similar to what the sweater coat makes me think of. I would love to knit the nostalgic sweater coat. Part of me is hang, is like, um, like there's three sweater coats I want to make that are not in super bulky. <laughs> So they would be time consuming projects. I just feel like, okay, got to focus on these blankets for gifts. And then maybe I'll take on a long term project like that. I don't want to lose steam on it if I don't have a lot of knitting time and just be like, well, this year I made one thing and I'm afraid I might get distracted from it at the moment, but there's going to come a day. I definitely want that one. <clears throat> uh, I, it's really nice. I'm putting it out here too. Oh, and I wanted to mention, this may not still be the case. Let me just say, 
I'm talking about backing away from consumerism a lot right now because I need to. And a lot of you felt the same urge. You've probably been kind of collecting supplies as long as me and we're maybe in the same place. But some of you don't have a ton of stuff, but you still feel the mindset changing you because we've all been on Instagram about the same length of time and we're feeling how it's rewiring our thinking and we want to change. So I am going to talk about patterns here. They're not all going to be free. There's absolutely no pressure to knit the pattern of the moment. Um, one of the things I am working on is a pattern of the moment, but my goals for this year are to knit some older patterns that I truly love. So just, I gotta say that before saying that Twist Top Beanie by Albina, I think it's still 40% off. It's already a good price for a knitting accessory. I feel like her prices are very um, affordable and on, like, maybe on the lower end right now of designer's prices, but it's 40% off often when she introduces something new. And that twist top beanie is interesting. And there's so many patterns coming out that look like something I already have. That is different. And it could be like a messy bun beanie or a ponytail beanie, uh, the way the twist top is, but just having it have that interesting detail on top and Claudia also mentioned that when we're talking about the dyers and indie dyers versus large companies, that sometimes large companies have perfected uh, con conserving water in their dyeing process. I hadn't ever thought of that, that that might make it a person who buys from a larger company might feel like, well, maybe, you know, I don't know about fair trade quality, this and that, but there is that aspect to it you might actually be conserving water by purchasing yarn from them. Denise said the winter's beach cardi is one that she wants to make and the long summer cardi by Hohi Locatelli. So the summer cardi I believe is a, is a lightweight and you could do it in, are you going to do it in um, summer yarns, summer weight yarns like linen or a cotton blend, Denise? Or are you still just thinking of like fingering weight or lace weight yarn, uh, wool yarn. Let me know. Also, Fair Winds and Following Seas by Melissa Kermer. Um, that's like a sweater jacket. Those are all beautiful. I have a couple of Hohe cardigans that are long. One is the Rugged Coat. That's the one I really want to make. And I have some yarn, like Cloudborn yarn, I bought on sale a while back and I thought, it's it's like bulky weight maybe it's worsted it's it's a it's the next up size of yarn weight but i've heard that cloudborn is kind of on the thin side so it actually probably would be the dk or worsted weight that um the rugged coat is supposed to be so i hope you guys are getting ideas if you have sweaters quantities of yarn you want to use up um Adina said the lattice lace poncho. She's already made one, wants to make another. Ponchos are a really good um, stash busting idea. And I added a bunch of ponchos to the Ravelry um, bundle. I put several on here that are longer projects. Sarik by um, Mary Jane Mucklestone by Gudrun Johnston. Sorry. Um, that's a dress with a little kind of a cute little apron front, color work detail, but you can go longer with the dress than what the model wears and it's fingering weight. You could use quite a bit of sock yarn. Junko Okamoto's Sawyer, another tunic-like dress. It can be a tunic, it could be a dress. That's another, it, there's a lot of positive ease to that too, with some sleeves, and that one would be a real stash buster. This is for, I think it's for bulky weight, yeah. But a textured, thick and thin, bulky yarn, wow, that would look great with this poncho. And what a good use for bulky yarn. Lone Kiltson, this, um, uneven, which 
is either Aaron or Bulky, I don't remember. But you marl with black and white yarn or any color combo you want. That's, um, looks like it's got a little ease to it. That might be a good stash buster. A Scardi V-neck by Ann Vensel. It's got quite a bit of ease on it and it's long. It looks tunic length, you can't even see the bottom in the sample there. And of course you can always knit any sweater longer if you want. The waffle blouse and it just looks like a really great, like it could be a great positive ease oversized sweater. That looks like something I borrowed from my husband's drawer and then never gave back. Yoki Doki. This one has some color work in it. Really, I had, I have some old favorites in that bundle. I just went through and looked up things that were dresses or tunics. This is for bulky weight yarn. This looks like fun though. This may be an older pattern. It just looks like fun. And honestly, if I were to wear a knit dress, I would want it to have positive ease. I wouldn't want it to be too clingy to me or I would feel like I was gonna go crazy. My favorite things knitwear has a lot of positive ease type sweaters. This vest, almost dress like, very tunic like. Could always add um, sleeves to it, but a lot of her product projects are similar. It's like sweater number 11. I love that drop sleeve right there. If you make that for yourself with a lot of positive ease, like it's modeled here, that should be a really good use for worsted or Aran weight. You know, like knitting through a chunk of it. This is a free one on Lion Brand. Um, I actually have this retweed yarn maybe even in this color and I thought of doing this for my little classic cabled sweater I want to make this year like just one kind of like the, remember when the handsome Chris came out that kind of pattern this is a really interesting stitch pattern and you've got that preppy looking striped v-neck remember you can always hold your worsted together for bulky this is an older one by Michelle Wong. It's got cables, which always takes more yarn. Mare by Vera Valmaki. Again, this one has a lot of a generous ease to it. It looks really comfortable. Like I would probably wear leggings or at least bike shorts under that just to feel comfortable. And I think that would be super cozy. Like if it were warm enough, cool enough here, I would wear something like that even just around the house. That might be one of those things, you know, people do when they work from home to kind of feel put together. They dress up, or at least they dress the top half of themselves. This is a poncho that is gorgeous. It's two color poncho. It's difficult to see in the lighting in the photo, but it's super moody lighting, so, you know. Svalborg by um, Sari Nordland. Looks like it would be a little more than the average amount of yarn you would use for a sweater of that length because of the massive cables. Look at the thick ribbing of the collar. It's actually a sweater. It's not a poncho, but it's got the poncho look. It's sort of a swing, swing top sweater. You got your turtleneck, but there's really stylish shorter sleeves and just the bell shape of the sweater. It has a poncho look which works with kind of a granny type Afghan looking crochet top. I think that's super cute. Um, this striped tunic, it's from Vogue Knitting 2010. You can find old Vogue Knitting patterns on Vogue and they're often, like they're usually $5 a piece, but then they have sales and when they have sales, they're like maybe half off or whatever. I love this. It's definitely 2010 looking and I don't know, maybe that's why I love it. I love the U-neck plus the drop sleeve, drop shoulder. Great Love is super popular. A lot of people have made it. It's a nice basic cardigan. Oh, okay, I gotta do one more. A Fistful of Stitches instead of A Fistful of Dollars. This one's by Audrey Nicklin, and it's a take on The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. A Fistful of Dollars, uh, the 
poncho Clint Eastwood wears. It's so good. That looks like so much fun. Okay, you see the type of sweater I'm wearing right here? This is the Julia sweater by, um, it's a Wool in the Gang pattern, but I'm not using Wool in the Gang yarn. This is like a Rowan 50-50 hemp and um, wool or wool cotton. Um, that's the fit of this Emily sweater. And I don't know if you can see it, but she's got color work. Like the front looks like a regular drop shoulder sleeved sweater with a bit of a puff sleeve at the bottom, but the back has texture, which is really interesting. And it's not, you know, a color work sweater. It's just one color and it's meant to have positive ease. So you might could work through some stash. And I just like that textural quality for when you're working with one color and you might feel like, mm, this gets boring, you know, the texture can make it interesting. Check out the um, bundle because there's a whole lot more. I just don't wanna drive you all crazy with it. So one of Alexandra Tabel's patterns, and she's doing a knit along for it right now, the Coast to Coast Wrap. Probably you can get kits for this on Lion Brand or something, but I wanted to stash bust. So I have a collection of basically similar um, similar weight and material yarn and navy so these are all touch of alpaca same um, material but I was trying to use stash so I also have wool ease and linen and wool ease and thrush this is almost a pinky uh, it's it's brown, but it has a bit of a pink hue to it. It's kind of a millennial brown. So five colors, mixing stash. They're very neutral. It's gonna be similar to the look of the actual wrap that you see. This will be the light color, you know, that's in the center back. So this is quite a bit of space to free up. I won't be like worried about making it with the wrap, the people who are doing it. I might not even, because of the baby blanket taking longer than I thought, I may not even start it with everyone else. My other big yardage project that I'd like to do, at least cast on while the knit along is happening, is Jane Richmond's Fernwood cardigan. Lion Brand Thick and Quick is easy care. And one thing I do love about Jane's patterns is that she does so much in budget or affordable yarn that, you know, hers looks great. This is how yours will look if you use a Lion Brand type yarn. So I have a few skeins in this raisin. Again, this will be another big space maker. Two objects making a lot of space, so just this raisin color. It's a tweed, it's like little, you know, tan flecks of tweed and nubs in there, hopefully in stash. I won't have to even buy buttons because there's only five buttons on this. And I love the pocket, so I'm excited to do it. The last Jane Richmond pattern I knit, I thought maybe my tension changed. I think what it was was I didn't knit it around my growing belly. <laughs> So I, it just didn't fit right to me, and I think it's just because it didn't fit right. <laughs> I didn't choose the right size to knit. So um, I never really got any wear out of it, and I was really disappointed about that because I was hoping it would be a little more like this will fit, and it being an open front cardigan, it that'll be even more forgiving were I to knit the wrong size, but I have decided to go, like, I'd rather go bigger and have extra ease than it be too small because that is maddening for me. I also want to talk about the Amatura wrap by Courtney Spain Hauer. Courtney quit designing a while back and I remember she put all of her patterns on sale or maybe even made them free for a while and now her site is down and I'd never got the pattern for Amatura so it looks like it's brioche and it looks like it's, say, the fit of this sweater. It's like, it's got a lot more positive ease if I were to knit it for me than the sweater does. But, you know, maybe meant to be, you know, um, she did have shaping for the neck, but knit, 
you know, front and back in brioche rib and then the sleeves down. There's some ribbing at the bottom of the cuff and then the bottom of the, um, it's got like a split hem, almost poncho like. It goes up, the split hem on the side goes up a little higher than normal so you would definitely be wearing a shirt underneath but the whole thing fits with such ease that it has a poncho sweater look to it. Um, but it doesn't have the arms that start way down here and kind of keep you you know, inhibit. Warning! Alien approaching! Um, it's got the sweater arms, but the flowy poncho body and the border around the hem is garter stitch. I love that and I really feel like ooh, I could just do it. I don't have to have a pattern. So those are my recommendations and yours. Speaking of stash, someone said mine was normal. Oh, Claudia, you said my stash looks normal in your opinion. Well, I thank you very much for that. That made me feel better about it. It doesn't feel normal, but I'm going to get through it. Um, Norma felt like, you know, uh, somebody just getting rid of their stash um, to start over or like, oh, this is driving me crazy. I'm just going to get rid of it and I'll start over with things I love is not really responsible. It's not something the average person can afford to do. And that's true. If you want to have consistent supplies for what you do, if you throw everything away and say, I'll start fresh, well, I mean, you probably have to have, uh, you know, the money to do that. If your stash is at a point, or your hoarding is at a point where you can't comfortably live in your home, like you can't close it up in a closet or a drawer, it's just everywhere and it's getting on everyone's nerves and it's oppressive, I do understand why someone would just want to at least clean sweep enough of the space that they feel like they can live um, healthfully. Um, Katie was saying that, you know, because I'd said, Katie, you have to have worked through your stash now. And I'm, apparently she's got a very small stash of yarn, but the patterns are another story. It's a very large stash or medium stash. And then on top of that, she has a very interesting stash of vintage making tools, which I, I'm sorry, make cool vintage stuff, collections. I just, I just can't fault anyone for having a stash of that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I hope you'll, maybe you've put some on Instagram and I haven't seen, but I'd like to see some photos of it. Tag me if you do. Um, Ophelia was saying having a tight budget, you know, kind of forces you to be creative and to focus on interesting ways to use what you've got. And she's a lot of lace weight, like thread weight, yarn and thread to use for um, this beautiful medieval tapestry blanket that she's going to start. I'm so excited to see this work up. But I mean, think about how long using thread will take. That will fill your year if that's all you worked on. Um, it would take a long time. That's very creative and she was also saying that there's a bit of a security in knowing, well, I have this, I'm going to stick with this. Not having a million options to distract you. There's a sense of security in having a plan and using what you've got. Karen um, was saying how she did, does her own budget and feels an extra responsibility to be smart with purchases because she handles the finances. Um, and also maybe having a super tight budget for years when she was younger also has done it. It really helps her when she feels the urge to buy. Um, she'll look at what's going on inside of her in the moment. Why do I want this so bad? Um, and sometimes she will, but she does only buy supplies when she's ready to make the thing. So um, I do think that sometimes when people grow up without any extras, um, sometimes when people grow up without even necessities, which I'm not saying is Karen's case, but I've known people that have a difficult time adjusting to when they do have money. Um, sometimes there's a save up mentality. Um, I talked with some friends about our parents or grandparents who had lived through the depression. Some people came out of the depression super frugal. I'm not going to pay for that unless I have to have it and I'm going to see if I can do it cheaper. But some people came out with a slightly different mentality. If something's on sale, I'm going to buy one for now and I'm going to buy one for later because you don't know what tomorrow brings. And 
Neither is a wrong way to look at things, but both ways, if you take them to an extreme, if you let it go too far, you know, we have a way in our mind of kind of warping stuff. A good tendency, like I have a good frugal, frugality tendency. I have a culture of frugality that I came from. We didn't have a lot when I was young. And uh, that's good. But sometimes it can actually lead me to purchasing too much. So I'm like, well, I've got to get it when it's on sale. And then, you know, what if I need an extra? And I talked to you all about uh, having something just in case. In this smartphone corporate world, I just feel like all of us now, like say my children's age, like everyone in their 20s forward <laughs> is growing up in such a consumerist culture. I just don't, I don't think you have to come from some harsh background to have a tendency to overspend, you know? It's just too easy to do. It's the mindset we have. It's the mindset we're being given or directed toward. Um, Adina's been watching that cyclical nature of marketing capitalism, you know, and craft for the last 20 or 25 years and remember some of the first Stitches conferences and going to yarn conferences when it was a really new concept and everybody would kind of breathe in the yarn fumes and, you know, buy and enjoy it. And there was sort of a culture, you know, pushing you to tee hee hee overspend. And it would be like, like the evening get togethers would be like, who's been a hundred? Who's been 200, 300? And people raise their hands about how much they spent. Like it's almost a little embarrassing, but also a little, um, I don't know, meant to be exciting. Oh, that's so weird to me. I think that's just weird. To, that will always be weird to me. Like saying, I spent this much. It's I come from a frugality culture, though. That's something to be ashamed of. Uh, maybe in my upbringing, to overspend. Even if it's money you save. Like, I went to two or three fiber events, and I saved to go to them. And one in particular, I saved specifically for certain yarn brands, and I bought them. But, like, I felt weird that um, I did have a brand new um, credit union credit card because we were trying to, like, protect ourselves from identity theft. And they see all this yarn stuff, and they're, like, flagging it. They won't let me spend anything. And I had to call and be like, no, I really do want to buy string that costs this much. But um, there was a sense of shame a little about it. I'm not saying that's great. I'm just recognizing it in myself, but yes, well now Adina sees like cross stitch is kind of going through that same consumerism push that the knitting world did. Um, all, a lot of that yarn, most of it that I bought at knitting events, do you know I haven't used? Yeah. Is that frugality culture? I have mostly used stuff like this. I was thinking that is a deal for me. Like I really have knit very little from those events. I keep saving it like special, my precious, you know, here's some tips for doing your own sort of no buy or buy less. Okay. How, how would, how would I do this for like social media? Do I have to, um, I guess I need to have like a facial expression here. Okay. Tips for not buying. Number one, replace your um, scrolly fingers. So like Karen was saying, Instagram is more of a temptation for her. She starts scrolling and seeing inspiring things. Oh, I'd like to make that. Maybe I'd like to buy that. And then she's wasted all of her knitting time, which I've noticed several of you have said you notice that in your life. So she watches YouTube. She knits while she watches. It's not the same time waster and it's not the same temptation. If you're getting a dopamine hit from the scrolling fingers, which I watched that episode of The Financial Diet where she interviews Hannah Poston and Hannah talked about a no buy year and her thing was luxury items and makeup and stuff. It's not what I would be tempted to buy. But she did talk about the dopamine hit you get online from scrolling and that the same receptors in your brain that are vying for 
like dopamine and serotonin are both vying for the same receptors in your brain and dopamine usually wins out. It's a bigger initial hit, but then it wears off, whereas serotonin is this balanced undercurrent of contentment. So when you're feeling true happiness and contentment, there's serotonin present. But if you're constantly dopamine hitting, you're kind of removing your body's ability to receive and promote serotonin. So you have to get balanced. And she noticed halfway into her year, she felt like, Hannah felt like her balance came back with a healthy amount of contentment and serotonin. And then she could really dig into some of her deeper overspending issues. So if you have scrolly fingers and you need to um, replace that with something, Virginia talked about loving the planning of a project. And sometimes after she's done planning, her desire to make it's kind of passed. So make planning in a free way kind of your thing, like do a Millanote, a Pinterest board, or um, some kind of mood board on Evernote where you put in pictures of your stash. I really recommend if you have a big stash and you don't want to buy more, but you're tempted, photograph your stash, get artsy with it, have fun with it, because you can get on Ravelry and you can really study the colors without having to dig for things. You can make mood boards on Millanote or something of stuff you'd like to make, maybe try and invent something, colors you love, plus your stash. And that might, I don't know, it might replace some of your need for beauty, art, design online from sites that will encourage you to spend. Um, Anna and Adina both like to physically reorganize their stash and hold things and that helps them kind of replace the desire to buy new and look at somebody's wares online. So like in my Ravelry, I will queue something up and I will find, I will queue up stash I think will work for it. And if you notice, if you click edit on a project in your queue, it will show little boxes, a little cube with the picture of the yarn. And you can check the colors and they'll be lined up like boop, boop, boop. And you can say, yeah, I think that will work. And by the time I'm finished, seriously, I noticed this when I first stopped spending on yarn. By the time I finished kind of putting in whatever could work and then looking at them all on my edit uh, stash of my queue, I was like, I, I don't even feel like buying. Nah, I'm tired. And I had something ready to go in my queue for the project. So I don't know, it might work for you if, if you really have an issue with that. Um, then look at why you're getting this dopamine hit. Why do you need this? Like at this point, it's probably habit for all of us, but where did it start? For me, it started with a few, like three years of intense grief, like three people passed away and a friend, so four people, and it was just a very hard time. And I had no real time to myself, no quiet time till around midnight. And sometimes, you know, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I don't want to like make, but I can scroll and I'm looking for something that mimics happiness because I'm not feeling it. And it wasn't just knitting stuff that I was that way about, but taking a break from it. Um, really, I think when I started healing from those sad years, I that's when I found I, I didn't have a need to purchase lots of stuff you know, anymore. Replace your reward system. Some people, um, get massages instead. I like um, to get organic fruits and veggies because it costs more, but if I'm not buying unnecessary stuff, and I don't just mean yarn, but just like a lot of unnecessary stuff, I can do that. Organic fruits and veggies, um, Dr. Pepper flavored live kombucha, which is weirdly specific, but that's one for me. Um, I join a gym, get involved in a club. I went walking. Um, around my neighborhood, which also helped to move where there was a lot to do outdoors that's free and also way much, much more healthy than looking at stuff online. Um, getting connected with the real world around you would be like number four, just to get real. You get connected with people around you. Remember that marketing, a lot of it is to push us to be antisocial. It's helping shape us into antisocial people and it's benefiting from our our little isolated bubble life. Like we Amazon everything because we live in a little bubble. We don't want to get out. We don't want to be social. So anytime you can reach out to other people, 
you're breaking that chain. And I found that when some of what you do is meeting other people's needs, and it doesn't have to be great volunteering things, but that's great if you do. But it could just be listening to someone, befriending someone. You start to see other people have hurts and needs and things, and it puts perspective on your life, especially if you've gone through a hard time recently, which I know some of you have in the last few years. Reconnecting with people. Uh, write a letter to a family member, especially an older family member. They like letters. Um, give someone a call. Anything that promotes community is going to help you not fall into a little isolated bubble of buying. And if you can give yourself a little bit of time, kind of like Hannah said, it took her six months, you can reset your contentment feelings, your serotonin receptors, you can kind of reset your habits too. Um, disconnecting from an artistic community, if it is encouraging you to kind of suspend reality and over purchase. So for knitters, we all know what that means. A lot of us have taken a break from knitting, uh, podcasts or Instagram, maybe YouTube. Um, I've heard several of you say that's been an issue for you. And if you need a break, even from this podcast, you need to do it because um, whatever helps you, especially for that reset period. Adina was talking about watching the very beginning of that consumer push in the knitting community. The knitting community was so vibrant and kind of exciting in the late 90s, early 2000s for me. Um, she saw that rising at these conferences and if you have to back away from that then you do i don't go to yarn festivals anymore i might one day when my stash is way down but i see zero point personally for me to go if i don't need to purchase because that is all i'm going to be seeing is neat stuff from really neat people who put a lot of themselves into it and i am going to want to support them i'm going to want to partake I just don't need it. But I can go to a class that maybe one of them offers online or at a local yarn shop and I feel really good about paying for that because it's knowledge, it's community, and it's not going to be a ton of stuff that I stock up on. I'm sure there'll be trunk shows along with it and that would be a temptation. But An interesting thing too about the artistic community um, thing was that young woman Hannah said that marketing, mar successful marketing knows that you, if you have a love of the artistic and the beautiful like she did for costume making, um, uh, writing, um, other things, they, if they can draw you into that element, that art and the design of their product, which for her, the weakness was clothing and makeup, they can kind of get you to transfer the joy you feel in your community into the purchasing of this thing, which is very much like what we've discussed in the past of kind of wishful thinking. You know, I want to be doing more of this, so I'll buy this thing and then I'll be able to do more of this. And I feel like the yarn is way even more easily translated into a yarn project than, oh, I love beautiful clothing and costumes and poems, so I'm going to buy makeup. You know, that's even less of a clear path than, oh, pretty colors and design. I want to have this because I like pretty colors and design. Separating that love of artistic beauty from purchasing. Find a way to separate them. Um, I thought that was a really cool idea that I got from her. Okay, purge and remove. That's what Eunice did. She knew I'm never going to really use this stuff. That's not who I am anymore. That's not me. And I'm just going to feel guilty or weighed down by it. Purge and remove. Also, when you're happier in the space you live in, you tend to not overspend. So purging might help you not ever over collect again. Um... Replace your budgeting, your purchasing math with budgeting math. So kind of like Karen does her budget. Um, oh, who was it? Oh, last week said you, you had a, um, I'll, I'll flash it down here. I'm going blank. 
you have a separate savings account for stuff you would have spent on yarn, but you're saving it for something else and you're going to see it grow. That's really cool. Budgeting for a vacation instead, or just saying, look what I'm saving. I feel so empowered. Having an accountability partner or telling the world on YouTube, I'm not going to spend any more on yarn this year or try not to. That's a really good way to make yourself follow through, saying it out loud. Um, and then I found that, like, I may have said this already, getting a new hobby, just um, not necessarily a replacement of knitting, but just something alongside that kind of brings back, that has no weird consumer stuff attached to it and brings back the joy of making and creating. That's really a cool thing to do. We got my mom's piano tuned, finally. It hadn't been tuned for like, I don't know, since Jesse was a baby. Um, the piano tuner would come and he would press a note and little baby Jesse would go, eh, and he would like match the note. It was sweet. Uh, I don't, I'm not good at it. I'm not, and I love it. I love sitting there and plonk, plonk, plonk on the piano, and I have like all those maybe intermediate youth uh, piano books, like, like easier version of box studies, you know. I just love it. I love it even though I'm not great at it. Um, and it, when I have time to do it, you know, since I am working now, I don't have as much time, but it is a creative booster. And even the work that I'm doing writing makes me feel so charged up with creative energy. So that might help you if you add another hobby that has nothing to do with spending to your knitting or crochet repertoire. You might, it might help you get through the buying, that period where you're jonesing for buying. Um, and as far as pattern buying, you guys had a lot of uh, comments, like a lot of you just wait till you are ready to make the thing to buy and you don't just fall for the sales, which I often, I did always fall for the sales. I am not every time now. I would say I'm only doing it, buying them a quarter of the times I would have before. But I will say, when these Gen Xers have birthday sales and the percentage off is equal to their birthday, I mean, you got to love 47% off on a pattern that you wanted. Yeah, I'm going to fall for that one. Um, but most people will tell you, if you don't fall for sales and you do not purchase till you need something in any area, crafting or not, even if you pay full price, for the product. You still are so far ahead and there's a sense of empowerment. I chose to pay more. That was my choice. It was not some instinctive emotional thing that a uh, advertising company had a grip on me. It was my choice. Plus I still save more money. There's something really empowering about that. So um, changes a lot of you have noticed or said and I've heard different ones say you do hang out in different places online or in person. You have a budget now. You are slow and thoughtful about your purchases. You take pride in what you buy and what you make and there's not a sense of shame. And more clearly see yourself, like if you had a, an issue with overspending. These are things I noticed. Um, I do spend less time on Instagram, which makes having hosting a knit along harder and it also keeps the knit along kind of small. Sorry you guys, but I'm also working, so I don't have a lot of time for it. Um, I'm outside more. My whole life got more streamlined. Like I, I find that I have decluttered my home, even though my yarn closet sucks. I've decluttered my home and I like don't overspend on that. I just like move stuff around to redecorate. I just found that I'm taking more pride maybe. I don't know, all of this really is I came off of just a few hard years and healed up some, probably. Most of the work was inner healing that had nothing to do with crafting, but a benefit was I got that in order too. I listen to new podcasts now that kind of broaden my horizons. Um, I haven't gone back to watching a lot of knitting podcasts. I don't think I'm afraid I'll wanna buy. I just think I found all these others um, the Y-Files is one that I've started watching recently. That's fun. 
kind of conspiracy theory, UFO, X-Files-ish type stuff. Um, Jenny Nicholson, I don't even know how she came up. She looks like she's like 12. I don't know how old she is really. But her YouTube channel is so funny and she'll do recaps and reviews on movies and like church theater and all sorts of stuff. And the neat thing about her channel, they're super long form. Tons of people watch them and they feel like the original YouTube channels, which I love. Um, the Financial Diet that I talked about a second ago, that's another one I like watching. And then I like watching a bunch of like home decor, um, the kind of thing where you use what you've got and DIY stuff like DIY with Danny, Alexandra Gator, we've talked about this, Paige Wassel, stuff like that. Um, and I never really went back to a lot of knitting podcast watching. I just want you guys to know that you really are encouraging one another here. Several people have reached out either on the Ravelry thread or personally just message me or talking in the comments here that this has encouraged them to either straighten up an area in their home that was a little out of control because they didn't want to think about it and it's improved their clarity and enjoyment of life or in Eunice's case to just really take a hard look and Anna had said this too um, and I think we talked about that last week really take a hard look at what you actually enjoy working with and over time you find certain fibers I really don't like it I have some really good linen and cotton yarns and I do want to use them because I can wear them but I don't enjoy knitting with them so it is a bit of a labor of love. Eunice realized that a lot of the acrylics that she was first learning to crochet and knit with just she didn't enjoy using them and she probably wasn't going to and had some wool so she boxed it up and sent it to a charity that would use it and a relative that would use it and loved it and it made them happy which made her happy and now she has all the space for other things. Her home feels organized and she feels really, really good about her making. There's no sense of shame hovering because she's made a decision. I don't want this. Gonna get rid of it. Um, that is basically because of you guys and your conversation. I really think the comments and the things people say make a difference and it encourages. But she was asking for free pattern ideas. So if you've got some good ones, that's one of the questions I'm asking. Uh, send them in the comments, put them in the Ravelry thread. I'm gonna try and remember everything and get it in that bundle. Um, Nutty Nitty Sisters went through and unsubscribed to all the yarn stuff that was coming in the emails and felt so empowered by it. I'm so glad to hear that you did that. I did that a bunch yarn stuff and then all sorts of products I've been getting. I did it with a bunch but I have to confess there are three that I have not been able to bring myself to unsubscribe to and they're my three biggest temptations but it's like Lion Brand, Ye Old Joanne, and Knit Picks because it feels like disowning a family member. Isn't that funny? They so have me wrapped around their finger that it feels like I'm disowning a family member if I don't get their newsletters and emails. So, here's my questions for you. First of all, free patterns, mention them. Eunice is interested. Check out the bundle if you want to see lots of different ideas. And once gain wonder projects because several of you were saying what you have is a bunch of single skeins in one color. You know, they're each different colors. So one skein wonder projects, please. And also, what are some other non-craft or non-knitting podcasts that you're into right now? All right, that's it. I don't know how entertaining this was, but I am three minutes late for church, so... I just wanted to get something up for you guys. Join the Stash Busting the New Year Cal. Uh, tag your stuff. There'll be some kind of prize, but mostly we're just encouraging each other. And I was so happy to hear from each one of you who have been encouraged. All of you responding and talking to each other in the comments. You are a resource for your knitting friends um, who are trying to kind of work through the stuff they've got and enjoy it. All right. I love you all. Bye.